Hello everyone, today, I'd like to explore a profound topic that affects all of us. The difference between people who can turn failure into growth, and those who simply experience it as a setback. Failure is the mother of success, we've all heard this saying, but what's the reality? After a presentation goes wrong, after receiving disappointing results on an important exam, or after making a mistake in a valuable relationship. Did you bounce back quickly and learn from it? Or did you just feel rejected and push? that experience deep into the recesses of your mind? The moments of most dramatic growth in our lives often come right after our most painful moments. To quote Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, I have not failed I've just found 1000 ways that won't work. This mindset might be what separates genius from mediocrity. Today, I want to share with you cutting-edge research from the University of Chicago about why it's so difficult for us to learn effectively from failure and concrete methods to overcome these barriers and transform failure into genuine learning. Goal Setting and Goal Achievement Goal pursuit consists of two stages, goal setting and goal achievement. Goal Setting Goal setting is the stage where we map out our life journey. Whether you want to become an astrophysicist, quit smoking, or become a famous actor, at this stage, we carefully consider what we want to do and what we can do. For example, imagine a young aspiring actor at a crossroads, should they challenge themselves in the competitive environment of a major city, like New York, or gain experience in their hometown first? People who fear failure tend to avoid the thorny path of major challenges and choose the safer, more familiar route. When choosing goals, we consider not only, how valuable is this goal, but also, how achievable is it for me? So when we perceive the possibility of failure as too high, we often avoid that goal altogether. Goal Achievement After setting a goal, we enter the action stage of goal achievement. With our objectives clearly defined, we take steps forward without hesitation. The most valuable skill at this stage is the ability to learn from failure. For instance, if a college student performs poorly on a difficult math test, but sincerely accepts that bitter experience, analyzes the causes, and recalibrates their strategy for the next test, they can stage a remarkable comeback. However, many students avoid facing the reality of failure directly, relinquishing valuable learning opportunities. As a result, they miss chances for growth that should have been within their reach. Emotional Barriers and Cognitive Barriers Research shows there are primarily two types of barriers that prevent us from learning from failure, emotional barriers, and cognitive barriers. Emotional Barriers First, let's consider the emotional barriers deeply rooted in our psyche. We are all beings who constantly wish to be our ideal selves. But the reality of failure mercilessly damages that beautiful self-image. In the early stages of goal setting, anxiety about potential future failure makes us hesitant to take on new challenges. For example, the fear that a physics class will surely be too difficult and beyond. One's comprehension can rob someone of the opportunity to learn about a field that interests them. There's an interesting experiment. Participants were shown ancient characters and asked to guess whether they represented animals or not. Researchers found that participants who received feedback that they were incorrect showed significantly lower learning rates compared to those who received feedback that they were correct. Failure deeply wounds our self-esteem, so we instinctively want to look away. But this prevents true growth. While we may temporarily protect our pride, we're sacrificing valuable opportunities for learning and development. Cognitive Barriers Next, let's look at cognitive barriers. This refers to the state where we don't notice, or refuse to notice, important information that can be gained from failure. Cognitive barriers appear from the goal-setting stage. Researchers conducted an interesting experiment using mystery boxes. Imagine three boxes in front of you. One contains $80, one contains $20, and one will cost you $1. Before choosing, you can get information about either which box contains $20 or which box will cost you $1. Which information would you choose? Logically speaking, knowing which box costs $1 confirms that the remaining two boxes both have positive outcomes. This means you'll gain at least $20, and possibly $80. This is clearly the optimal strategy. Yet, in the experiment, about one-third of participants chose to learn the location of the $20 box instead. This demonstrates our tendency to be drawn more strongly to information about potential gains rather than avoiding losses. And during the goal achievement stage, learning from failure requires a more complex thought process. Learning from success gives us direct answers, this was correct, 
But learning from failure is more abstract and multifaceted. This was wrong, so let's consider other possibilities. Learning from success follows the relatively simple logic of, repeat what worked. But learning from failure involves the laborious task of guessing and analyzing, what went wrong, and, how it could have been done better, by mobilizing all our past experiences and knowledge. Many people unconsciously try to avoid this intellectual effort. How we perceive failure greatly influences our subsequent motivation. Research suggests that we tend to interpret our actions from either a, commitment, or, progress, perspective. Commitment, is the belief that, this goal is important to me and achievable. For example, thinking, this project has social value, and if I maximize my abilities, I can definitely succeed. On the other hand, progress is the recognition of how steadily we're advancing toward our goal. For example, feeling, once this difficult part is completed, half of the project will be done. I'm making steady progress. The crucial point here is that when we interpret failure as low commitment, the feeling of resignation surfaces, I guess this goal was impossible for me after all. For instance, a student who fails a math test might conclude, I just don't have a talent for mathematics. However, if the same failure can be interpreted as insufficient progress, it generates energy to move forward again toward the goal, I didn't put in enough effort yet. Let me try a more effective study method. Interestingly, research shows that beginners in goal achievement tend to interpret failure as low commitment. Whereas experts in that field tend to view the same failure as insufficient progress. For example, a beginner pianist who can't play a difficult piece may think they lack musical talent, while an experienced pianist views the same failure simply as needing more practice time or reconsidering their practice method. In other words, if we can consciously adopt the thought patterns of experts rather than beginners, we can learn effectively from failure without fear and continue pursuing our goals longer. So, what specific approaches can we take to learn from failure and use it as fuel for growth? Researchers propose various intervention methods to transform failure into learning. These can be broadly categorized into methods that change the meaning of failure and methods that promote the process of learning from failure. First, reinterpret failure not as low commitment, but simply as insufficient progress. By reframing failure as a sign that more effort is needed, we can regain a positive mindset toward our goals. Educators and leaders can support students and subordinates in constructively interpreting failure and learning from it by clearly communicating the message. You are still in the process of achieving your goal. Second, there's a highly effective technique called self-distancing. This is a method of consciously viewing yourself objectively from a third-person perspective to prevent becoming overly caught up in the situation or emotions of failure. For example, after an unsuccessful presentation, rather than emotionally dwelling on thoughts like, I'm really a terrible person. Try thinking as if advising a friend, what went wrong with my friend's presentation this time? How could it be improved next time? Surprisingly, research shows that this simple technique reduces negative emotions after failure. Allowing for a more calm analysis of the situation and identification of specific improvements. Interestingly, research shows that people learn more effectively from others' failures than from their own. Studies reveal that when people make incorrect answers themselves, their learning rate is significantly lower, but when observing others make mistakes, the learning effect is almost equivalent to seeing the correct answer. This is a very useful finding for educational and team environments. Teachers can create an environment where students learn efficiently without emotional burden by sharing specific examples of where past students stumbled. Applied to daily life, sharing failure stories with friends or colleagues who have the same goals could accelerate each other's growth. How we interpret failure also greatly impacts subsequent behavior. For example, if a student who fails a test thinks, the problem was too difficult, I just don't have talent in this field. Or, there's nothing I can do about it, they're likely to feel powerless and give up. Conversely, if the same failure can be interpreted as, my study method was wrong, my preparation before the exam was insufficient, or, if I study more systematically next time, I should get better results, failure becomes reflection material, sparking motivation to improve specific actions for next time. Educators and parents can encourage children's constructive response to failure by conveying messages like, you can do it and changing your method will change the results. Professor Carol Dweck of Stanford University proposed two contrasting concepts, fixed mindset and growth mindset. 
people with a fixed mindset believe that human abilities are innately determined and cannot be changed later and tend to interpret failure as evidence that I don't have that talent. In contrast, people with a growth mindset believe that abilities can be developed through effort and learning and view failure as a sign that I haven't practiced or put in enough effort yet. Numerous studies have shown that students with a growth mindset actively choose more difficult and challenging tasks, and even when faced with failure, they continue to work persistently without giving up. Parents and teachers can nurture children's growth mindset by praising not just results, but the process of effort and encouraging them with phrases like, not yet, instead of, failed. To truly learn from failure, intrinsic motivation, finding value in the activity itself and genuinely enjoying it is extremely important. If you can perceive studying or work not as something painful that must be done, but as an interesting exploration that satisfies intellectual curiosity, it becomes easier to positively accept failure as valuable feedback in the growth process. For example, rather than studying solely for the external reward of getting good grades on tests, having an intrinsic motivation, like, I want to deepen my knowledge in this field and broaden my view of the world, allows you to turn even test disappointments into constructive learning, what didn't? I understand? What approach should I take to learn better next time? Educators and parents should not only rely on external rewards, but also stimulate the joy of learning and intellectual curiosity to enhance children's intrinsic motivation. Interestingly, research shows that when struggling with failure, giving advice is more effective for improving one's own behavior than receiving it. People struggling with saving money improved their saving behavior more by giving advice to others than by receiving advice from experts. Similar results were found with middle school students' homework engagement. Students who gave advice to other students improved their homework habits more than those who received advice from teachers. This is because when giving advice, we organize our knowledge and convert it into concrete action plans. By thinking about, what advice would I give to someone in the same situation, regarding our own failure experiences, we gain deeper insight into ourselves. Counterfactual thinking, if I had done that instead, is also an effective tool for learning from failure. When a student who failed a test thinks, if I had studied more systematically, I would have gotten better results, their action plan for next time becomes clearer. Research shows that students who engaged in such, if only, thinking after tests actually improved their learning habits for subsequent tests. Specifically imagining, what could have been done better, after failure deepens valuable learning for next time. This method is particularly effective for overcoming cognitive barriers. Finally, the surrounding environment is also important for learning from failure. In a culture where failure is shameful, people hide their failures, and as a result, repeat the same mistakes. The concept of psychological safety refers to an environment where one won't be criticized for failing. If psychological safety is high in homes, schools, and workplaces, failures can be openly shared and everyone can learn from them. According to research by Professor Edmondson of Harvard University, teams with high psychological safety tend to learn from failures and generate innovative ideas. Creating an environment where people can experiment without fear of failure is key to learning and growth. Learning from failure isn't easy, but it's a skill that can be developed through scientifically backed methods. By understanding emotional and cognitive barriers and using appropriate strategies, you too can transform failure into a springboard for growth. Let's review the effective methods. Interpret failure as insufficient progress, rather than lack of commitment. Reduce emotional impact through self-distancing. Utilize opportunities to learn from others' failures. Cultivate a growth mindset. Enhance intrinsic motivation. Take the position of giving advice. Utilize counterfactual thinking. Create a culture that accepts failure. By incorporating these methods into your daily life, you'll be able to use failure as a source of learning, just like Edison did. Failure is inevitable in life. What's important is what we learn from failure and how we apply it next time. I hope today's talk has given you a new perspective on how to face failure. Thank you for watching. Please share your experiences and questions in the comments section. Stay tuned for next time. Did you know Google conducted a study to discover what makes a great manager? Surprisingly, technical skills weren't the top factor. Instead, they uncovered eight key behaviors shared by their most effective leaders.
In the next video, we'll unpack these findings through the lens of behavioral science and show you how to apply them to your own leadership and team success. Stay tuned. If you found this video helpful, please let me know with a like. For practical solutions using behavioral economics, don't miss the next video by subscribing to our channel. Catch new episodes twice a month in the second and fourth Friday at 6 p.m. Japan time.